tonight. A lot of people have asked for the opportunity to stand up and talk about Jack. So that's what we're going to do. And please, while you're listening to them, if you would like to add something, then by all means do it. We're not in a hurry, and this party will go on as long as you all want. If you have commitments later on, please feel free to leave whenever you like. Please don't forget to sign the book for Jack's daughter, Lonnie. For those of you who didn't see the obituary notice in the paper, there'll be a memorial service for Jack this coming Saturday at 11 a.m. at the Emanuel Congregational Church in Hartford at the corner of Woodland and Farmington Avenue. I would like to thank Hank Glover, the president of the Light Opera, and all our friends who worked so hard to make this evening possible. And I would also like to introduce members of Jack's family who are here. Bonnie was too emotionally upset to make the trip from Seattle. And if I miss anybody, I'm sorry. We'll let you know. <laughs> we have some cousins here, uh, Barbara and Harold Manston, and Dick and Errol North are sitting right there. Son Roy, uh, and uh, daughter Bonnie and husband Ken Beatrice. And uh, let's see if I can uh, pick out uh, uh, Jack's brother, Roger. And uh, you have no idea how difficult it has been for 31 years to have another Roger in the family. Nice one at that. Especially his last name begins with L. But he's the one that sings though, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and sings well. Uh, and uh, um, uh, Jack's brother Art with the camera. And uh, Jack's sister Laurel here from Dayton, Ohio. Your husband, Tom Shivitz, and uh, Marjorie, whom most of you know, and my daughter, Corey, and my son is on an aircraft carrier somewhere in the North Sea, so he couldn't be here today. And uh, certainly, last but not least, if I haven't uh, missed anybody else, uh, Jack's daughter, Lonnie, and her husband, David Seitz. <laughs> Oh, I forgot. <laughs> I'm sorry. How about Mrs. Jack's L? The most important person of all, Jack's mother, who is sitting here in the front row and who will soon be celebrating her 90th birthday. Yeah. I have a few things to say about my relationship with Jack which goes back, obviously, many, many years. And uh, most of the things that I have to tell you are kind of funny. A couple of them involve Sheldon Baker. <laughs> I remember one time about nine or 10 years ago when my house needed re-roofing. And uh, Jack said, we can do that. And I said, what do you mean, we? And he said, you and me, we can do that. We get a little help. So we enlisted Sheldon and uh, uh, in the middle of July, we re-roofed the house. Bear in mind, my house has a roof that's 80 feet long, and it was so hot up there that you couldn't kneel down without burning your knees. And after Sheldon was up there for a few minutes, he said, I can't stand this. And we had a way of getting to the roof by way of the deck of the pool, where you could climb up on a shed and up onto the roof. So I said to Sheldon, go out to the refrigerator and get some beer and bring it back. And Sheldon did, and he came up on the deck of the pool, and. Jack was up on the roof with me, and Jack had on one of these carpenter's belts, and so he leaned over to get the beer, and the hammer fell out of his belt and hit Sheldon right on the head. <laughs> That's the only time I ever spilled a drink in my life. He's been ever since. Now you, know, now you know why Sheldon is the way he is. And uh, I can still remember Jack looking down, and looking at Sheldon, who was by then spread eagle on the deck of the pool, saying, don't spill the beer! <laughs> and one night, uh, I remember Jack left my house in a state which could only be described as unsafe to drive. And at the bottom of the mountain, he had a blowout on his uh, car and drove all the way to Unionville on the rim. <laughs> and uh, the, a couple of days later, when he told me about that, I said, Jack, didn't you notice anything? He said, well, I thought the ride was a little bumpy. 
Uh, and of course, who can ever forget the the first big luau that that Jack had at uh, at Rhoda's uh, Rhoda Babcock's backyard? You know, we all marveled about the fact that Jack never got any sleep, and this was a typical uh, occasion for him. We had a three-day party for this luau, and the first day was involved with digging this huge pit, and we all brought over boulders in our cars so we could line the pit with boulders, and we had a big party that night. This is pre-luau, you understand. And, uh, and everybody got royally snockered, and uh, at about the midnight, uh, I was singing uh, some song in the backyard, and right in the middle of the last note, Sheldon let off the biggest bunch of firecrackers you ever heard in your life. I'll never forgive you for that, by the way. And neither will most of the neighbors in West Hartford, because they called the police. <laughs> and uh, one neighbor was particularly vociferous, so Jack, uh, in order to placate her, went over and invited her to the party, which was then going in high gear at about midnight. And she came over, and after a couple of hours, she had had about seven or eight drinks, and she decided it was time to wobble back to her house, whereupon she fell into the pit. <laughs> it was a shame because she broke her ankle and somebody had to cart her off to the hospital. <laughs> we gave her a drink to go. <laughs> she never did sue, did she? She kept on going all night. Jack, uh, Jack tended the, uh, the fire, which was then started, put the pig in, had the luau the next night. As far as we could figure out, he stayed up for about 48 hours in a row but that was typically Jack. And I always remember Jack as a board member of the Simsbury Light Opera Company, because one of the funniest sights I can remember is the fact that when the chorus cries out for the Light Opera, they all stand up in a row on the stage at the high school and they sing. And all the board members walk up and down listening to all these voices. And if you knew Jack, you know, his singing voice was not his strong point. And, and I said to him, Jack, who are you trying to kid walking up and down looking so serious? I said, by the sound, you couldn't tell the difference between a soprano and a baritone. He said, that may be true, but by the looks, I can tell the difference. <laughs> I think I've said about enough for a while. I'd like to call on another uh, person to uh, uh, make a few remarks. And I meant what I said. I'm going to call on a few people the evidence to me that they would like to say a few words. And the rest of you, if you want to say something, by all means, uh, keep it in mind. And uh, there'll be plenty of opportunity. Sheldon? Well, obviously, uh, many funny things happened to, uh, to Jack and I. We really go back quite a long ways. Uh, I first got to know Jack, I think, about 76, somewhere uh, around there, building sets and being involved in the Light Opera Company and through my friendship with Roger. And uh, we had uh, some tremendous times. And, uh, uh, as I say, there are many funny times that we had. I, I guess my, I started up trying to remember a lot of the funny things that happened and did, but uh, I guess my remarks are a little bit more of a, a serious nature. And uh, uh, I just got to thinking about it this afternoon, and probably like a lot of you here, I've had a, a very difficult time the past week and a half. And uh, you know, Jack's passing, I think, will take a long time for, uh, for me to really accept and, and absorb. It's, it's really kind of like the time uh, four years ago when my mother died. I'd make plans to tell her about this or that or small bits and pieces of daily life and the, all the things that we did and, and finally realized that I, I couldn't really talk to her anymore. And uh, it was very difficult to realize that she was not. It's going to be difficult for me to realize that Jack is gone too. Uh, uh, we uh, had shared a lot of things uh, in common. One was love of food. And uh, when I went out to live at this little place next door to Jack, uh, I began to get an education in cooking, and uh, I guess we probably educated each other in, in the art of, of drinking as well. <laughs> <laughs> this is when I was in the restaurant business, and uh, uh, I couldn't even come up with the, uh, he and I were both having some hard financial times at this point, and uh, as my last monthly payment, I'll never forget that I was in the restaurant uh, at that point, and we could order booze on the cuff from from various distributors. I hope nobody here from the state of Connecticut tonight. But, uh, I'd order, I ordered a household supply, and as part of my last payment to Jack, I gave him four bottles of Remy Martin because I knew that I could pay for it in time over the next 
three or four months, and that seemed to sit pretty well. So it also made a lot of nice desserts. <laughs> uh, uh, but Uncle Jack was, was very understanding about my uh, not always paying on time, and uh, uh, we had many uh, deep philosophical discussions in our skivvies well into an August night. Uh, another, uh, of course, one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me in my life is meeting Brenda. Uh, Jack and Rhoda were responsible for that. Of an August night when, uh, in 1978, uh, we sat there and told quite a few stories. I kind of liked what I saw, and evidently you did too, Brenda. <laughs> <laughs> is going to come <laughs> But anyway, uh, Jack and, and Rhoda were responsible for that. And we knew in 15 minutes we went... <laughs> Did you know? <laughs> I was a willing victim. <laughs> and then uh, Brenda was so sick after that uh, for the next, oh, two, three years, I guess. The first bright and cheerful face that shined through was Uncle Jack's you know, sitting in the hospital room. I, of course, went through all of this rigor of calling the doctors uh, as to when I should be there and uh, what I should do, and the doctors all said, uh, well, she won't know a thing or see anybody or recognize anybody, so why don't you come down to the hospital uh, at such and such an hour? And I'd get there, and of course, Uncle Jack would be sitting there, and Uncle Jack would be talking to Brenda. <laughs> at that point, I realized that uh, this was a man who, who really uh, took friendship very seriously. Uh, uh, he was... He was my friend, uh, one of the best friends I'll ever have. And uh, how do you say goodbye or uh, to your father or your mother or your brother or to Uncle Jack? I should miss him. I'm going to miss him. All of us. It's going to be very hard. Bear with me. Uh, when Roger and I were talking about this astounding news of Jack, I, we couldn't believe it. And we started talking about him, what he meant to us, and how unbelievable this wonderful person who's so alive. Well, one of the things we talked about was he burned his candles at both ends, and uh, we got a book of poetry out, and I had to write it down to make sure I wouldn't forget. But Edmund St. Vincent Millay wrote a few lines that were so meaningful because to me they represent a thought, part of Jack that were very meaningful. It goes, my candle burns at both ends. It will not last the night. But ah, my foes and oh, my friends, it gives a lovely light. And that is Jack. He gave a lovely life. He knew he was so close to me. And I was so grateful now. I, I see, you know, I can talk about him. <laughs> he met an awful lot. We became friends. Not only was he my big brother, but he came a beloved friend too. Jack was a happy-go-lucky guy, and I'm sure that he would want everybody here to be happy and enjoy themselves tonight. He came from a family of seven children. And he was the oldest one. We had a mother who was sitting here, 89 years old. Well, 50 years ago, we had a housewife. And our father was a dreamer in, in Benton. I wouldn't say that our uh, household was disorganized, but when I was about 14 years old, I ran away from home. <laughs> Three days later, I came back, and nobody knew. <laughs> 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 Jack was a very smart kid. He went to school, he skipped so
so many grades that when it got time for him to graduate from high school, he was so young that he had to stay in school and take uh, high school postgraduate courses until he was 16 years old. He had a remarkable memory. He could read a paperback book in 45 minutes and five years later tell you all about it. I remember a couple years ago we had a cookout at my house and Jack was there. We had about 15 people and uh, we were playing trivia for soup. <laughs> we would have taken everybody on one side, and Jack on the other side, and Jack would have won easily. He just seemed to know all the answers. And he never watched television. <laughs> really. That's what's that's right. more amazing because a lot of that was contemporary information. Somehow he absorbed it. Except sports. He didn't care about sports. <laughs> so anyway, he went into the Air Force, and while he was training in Texas, a 50 caliber shell went off in his hand. This put him in the hospital for a couple of months. <clears throat> and the original crew that he was with went on without him. And after a while, they were shot down over Germany. Jack was the flight engineer and the lead gunner on the B-17 bomber. He had 25 missions over Europe, came back to the United States, and he was learning to fly in a super fortress so he could bomb Japan, but then the war ended. He went off to college, got his degree in engineering and a master's in mathematics, and then he went on to the aerospace industry. While he was an engineer at Grumman, he taught advanced mathematics to the other engineers. He ended up at uh, Boeing Aircraft out in Seattle, and he had 80 engineers under his supervision. When the government stopped funding the project he was working on, <clears throat> that's when he came back to Connecticut. Now, there was a service for Jack in Seattle on Thursday I was there. I was talking to some of the engineers, and they told me of their affection and admiration for him. And they also said the reason they wanted him back so badly was because the project they were working on now Jack's old crew had done most of the basic research from before. So anyway, Jack came back to Connecticut and he got two jobs. He went to work for his father and he went to work for Sloco. Neither one of them very well. <laughs> it was about this time that he became a real gourmet chef. He had a great taste for fine food. And he really couldn't afford it at that time, as Sheldon was telling you, there was a couple of mean years there. Mm. So he would volunteer to make a gourmet meal for anybody that would provide the food. And it worked so well that he started the new fragrant school of cookery. And that way, all the students brought their food, and every week they had a fantastic gourmet feast. And it was about this time that he got started with the, hoop, the uh, luau. He had the first annual one in my backyard. I can remember going over to his house one Sunday for brunch. Got there around 10, 10.30. And we didn't eat until 3 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Jack, how come you always make everybody wait so long before you serve the food? His answer, hunger is the best sauce. <laughs> you know, as an older brother gave me lots of good advice, and the one I liked most of all was if somebody does you wrong, whether they're justified or not, forget it. Forgive them. Because if you carry hard feelings in your heart, you're only going to hurt yourself. And that's the way he was. He didn't hate anyone. And you know, whenever I hear Frank Sinatra sing, I did it my way, I took Jack. 
Jack did it his way. Thank you. John's Church Choir, and the St. John's Church Choir in a couple of minutes is going to sing. But before they do, I think I ought to tell you why there is a connection between Jack Lunderberg, who couldn't sing, <laughs> and the St. John's Church Choir, who certainly can. And several years ago, Jack was living in an apartment on Farmington Avenue, three or four blocks from St. John's Church. I sang in the choir. And one day he called me up and he said, uh, you have a choir rehearsal on Wednesday night, don't you? And I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm going to do a little experimenting with food Wednesday night. And he said, uh, why don't you come over afterwards and, uh, and join us? We're going to have a, a nice feast. I said, well, Jack, I, I carpooled with two guys from Manchester, David Kennedy and Eric Coates. Oh, that's all right. He said, bring them along. So I did. And uh, we had a wonderful time. And, and about a month later, he called me up and he said, you know, that was a lot of fun. He said, uh, I'm going to do that again. He said, but uh, bring a few more folks along. <laughs> How many more is a few? He said, oh, eight or ten. So I said, okay. And bear in mind, this apartment was, to put it mildly, small for those of you who were in there. And Sheldon and Brenda lived right next door. The outlet valve. The outlet. <laughs> they, they had everything but a connecting door. Anyway, so I brought the eight or ten over, and three or four months went by, and he called me up again. He said, you know, I, I'm going to do it again. He said, uh, bring the whole choir. So, uh, he said, but Jack has like 22 people. Oh, that's all right. Bring them all. Uh, so thereafter, for years, and Ralph can bear me out here, for years, every three or four months, Jack would call up and say, it's time to have the choir over. <laughs> and, uh, you know, people said, what can we do for this man? And so I said, well, bring him a bottle of wine. So by golly, his wine cellar was well stocked <laughs> from then on. And we had, you know, uh, beef wellington, uh, uh, poached salmon, uh, an incredible Syrian... The king duck. <laughs> the duck, remember? All, all the yeah, red absolutely. cooked ducks. I mean, it was just... Escargot casserole. Just, yeah, just, yeah, escargot casserole. Scallops. Uh, went on Parmesan. for years. And, uh, you know, they... The, 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 you sure did. Just before Jack and, and Bonnie went to Seattle, by that time we were having all these feasts right. at, at the, their house in West Hartford. And uh, just before they went to Seattle, they had the biggest feast of all for the, the whole choir over there. And, uh, of course, they made Jack an honorary member of the choir. And uh, every time there was a choir picnic, Jack went, and uh, we all had a great time. And that was the kind of man Jack was. He never asked for anything. He just wanted to make people happy. And he sure succeeded. And so when Ralph and the choir found out about the fact that we were going to have this celebration, and it is a celebration tonight for Jack, they said, we have to sing. And so the St. John's Church Choir, under the direction of Ralph Valentine, uh, is going to sing. And in case you wonder about the fact that Barry Whetstone is in the choir, I should point out to you that Barry is not a ringer. He comes by this honestly because for the last two Christmas Eves, he has sung with the St. John's Church Choir at their Christmas Eve service. And for all of you Episcopalians in the audience, I want you to, say, to feel not nervous about this because there is absolutely no chance that Barry will convert as far as <laughs> However, here is, here is the St. John's Church Choir. Jack was in the Boy Scouts, and some, some summers in his teenage years, he went to Camp Pioneer. 
Now, in order to swim in the swimming area, you had to swim across the lake, which was a half a mile. What Jack did was he swam the other way, which was five miles. <laughs> uh, I'll miss my brother. He had a tremendous influence on me. Uh, I can't tell you how lucky I am to have had a brother like Jack. Uh, incidentally, when I got to Camp Pioneer, they wouldn't let me swim the long way. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to say is that I'm not really superstitious, although I'm Irish. <laughs> the night we heard that, that Jack was gone, we couldn't do anything, so we went out for a walk. And we found that we couldn't walk, so we came home. And then we sat and we talked about Jack and all the things he meant to us, and a cricket started chirping. For a long time, and we talked about Jack. And then he stopped. And then the next night, we were talking with Lonnie and David, and we were talking with Bonnie, and we were talking with Roger and Marjorie. And every time we picked up the phone to talk to someone, the cricket would start chirping. And finally, we said, We think that's Jack. We're not sure. <laughs> But now I'm really sure, because tonight, when the choir was singing, Sheldon was standing up here, I think he was right about here, and he was saying, <laughs> I hadn't known Jack very long. In fact, I hardly knew, where he knew him when I mentioned one time at uh, one of our Sloco rehearsals that my kitchen cupboards were falling down and someone said maybe uh, you might have an idea of what I should do about it and uh, he said yeah he said I'll fix it and so next day he came over and we took everything out of the cupboards and had it all over the house and he fixed those kitchen cupboards and I mentioned to someone here what a Phenomenal job he did. He said, Yeah, your house will fall down someday, but those cupboards will fall down. <laughs> and, here, here. and I just, I mean, I, yeah, I look at those kitchen cupboards when I'm in the kitchen, which isn't too often, and uh, I think of Jack, and then went and built some uh, other uh, shelves for me because I needed them. But he, I hardly knew the man, and he came and did that, and he was just wonderful. And of course, for those of you who attended the, the luau, I mean, that was just a phenomenal thing. I, I couldn't believe it. People said to me, how come you're letting all those people dig a hole in your bed? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, well, it's, well, you know, no, no problem. It's kind of snowball. <laughs> <laughs> it, did, it, did, it did, it did yeah. snowball. And uh, there were people, uh, Jack invited people, and my daughter invited people, and other people invited people, and. And there were a lot of people there I didn't even know. I mean, <laughs> and, uh, and my daughter's friends invited invited some. I, you know, it's too bad not everybody here was there, but it was it was quite special. And uh, and uh, I, Sue Sue Gordon just reminded me of something that uh, that was so typical and it, it, the gentlemanly part of Jack. And we had all attended a sloco picnic and uh, that, that was the bus trip those of you remember the bus trip well there were several several of us that helped Jack get to
to his apartment. Now this is a, a third, was it third floor, wasn't it, Brenda? A, a lot of steps. Yeah. And after we got him up there, he wanted to escort us back to our car. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I mean, a big, big heart that man had, and still has, and uh, we will all rejoice in his memory. Yeah. We have a, a couple of pictures on the bulletin board of that luau. Also, uh, a framed picture over there, I think behind Jean Fenn somewhere, there is a picture that Brenda had in her house of that same luau. The famous, very, very famous luau. Let me just explain some of the pictures I brought on the bulletin board. The big one in the middle is Jack putting up more cabinets. <laughs> More that's stuff. What that is right there in the middle. More what? More stuff. More cabinets. More kitchen cabinets in his new kitchen right there. Uh, the one on the upper left is Jack in his famous hat on the set of the Mikado. Next to that is 1983 picnic at the Glover's Lake. Uh, this big slow go picnic every year. Okay, and that long line in the middle is about the. Uh, well, it shows Jack at his birthday party in 1983, November 15th, it was. He had admired a plow that summer when he was up in Maine with his friend Olive Metcalf and Bonnie. And little did he know what was in store for him on his birthday. They had it all shipped down. And they brought it in, and you can see the sequence of events of that plow. Now, that, he couldn't believe it. That plow went with him to Seattle. <laughs> Not only that, but last Thursday, in the backyard where they had a memorial service for Jack, that plow was there with the flowers around it as part of the service because that became his favorite possession. Is there someone else who would like to say something? Uh, one thing that I didn't say, and this is a very brief word about Christmas. Jack was, was one of the people that kept Christmas probably as well or better than anybody since Charles Dickens. And uh, every year at Christmas time, uh, Jack would wrap up literally 12, 14, 15 gifts. And he'd spend the whole day unwrapping things. And uh, he had little clues as to what it might or might not be. And, uh, you, sometimes they bore no relation. And, and uh, there was always some little surprise. There was inevitably some kitchen gadget or something that was terribly useful uh, uh, or something terribly important to you, a book about some topic. The thoughtfulness of the man and the, the thoroughness of Jack uh, as far as every detail and all the memories that he had of all the conversations that he had had with him was really incredible. And uh, Christmas, it all came out and it all blossomed out. And uh, it's another thing that I'll never forget as long as I uh, He was a man who really kept Christmas, I guess, the way the spirit is supposed to be. And, uh, uh, that's going to be a, one of the, the special good memories that I have. Yeah, every Christmas. I see uh, Jack Nicholson here. Uh, Jack Nicholson, Jack Nicholson. Who wasn't here earlier has arrived and has indicated he'd like to say something. Yes, <coughs> Russell. Well, <coughs> first thing I wanted to uh, remind some of you about, maybe you know, but uh, Jack Jack came from a rather large family. In fact, it spanned a couple of generations. Uh, when I was small, Jack was a legend. <laughs> I, yeah. I can remember that uh, that legend, which was greater than life. And Jack was also an enigma, as many of you may know. And as I'm listening to all of you, and as I have uh, have known of Jack, really through some of you people, I realize that you actually participated and experienced this legend, which I only knew as a small child. 
um, which is really, really remarkable. So, in a way, I'm envious of all of you, and I, I think you're quite lucky to have actually lived the legend that I only knew of as a small child. And uh, I'm glad that this gathering did occur, though I had my misgivings about it. Um, because I realized that, that there is a great deal of love among all of you. There was a lot that Jack still is, and I know that he loved all of you. Um, I can remember when I was quite young, some of the stories that, that I would hear, one of which really fits into Jack's character, and that was when he, uh, when he volunteered for the draft during the Second World War. He wasn't satisfied with the uh, government issue. He had all his uniforms tailor-made. That's an amazing story. That's a shock. Uh, Jack is That's out of character. <laughs> well, he remained relatively trim throughout his years, but when he was uh, 18, I think he had a 28-inch waist. I don't know if that's exactly right, but it's which is about what I had when I was at <laughs> <laughs> But uh, uh, I, I can remember the, the stories about his experience during the war, which he didn't talk about, but I heard about it second year. And the, the things that he did, his luau's, in fact, I went to one of them. Uh, <laughs> it took an awful long time for the pig to get cooked, but it tasted pretty good. Um, and I, I, I don't have to tell you, you have you've all experienced many of the uh, the great things that Jack did, I, mean, I could say excessive things, because he did everything to an excess, to, to an extreme, or to perfection, depending on your point of view. Uh, I like to think of this point of perfection. Um, complex, yes, very complex. Brilliant. Um, I gave a I gave a lecture on patent law. I'm not an attorney, I'm an engineer, as Jack. So we have some, something, like all of us, all the brothers are in that field in one way or another. And I, I gave a lecture at uh, Hartford State Technical College, where I'm the adjunct professor. And one of the fellows from the, from the audience came up after. He said, you know, I work with Jack at Grosside. I said, oh? He's also a I said, yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a remarkable person. Do you know how, how brilliant he is? And I said, oh, really? He knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> Just before Jack left, I, I went over to Grosside because I, I thought it'd be nice to have lunch with him before he left. And it turns out he had already left, although he hadn't gone, made his uh, uh, trip to uh, California. And the people there, um, remarked about how well liked he was. So we, I can see that he has reached many people in many respects. And in a way, I'm envious that, that uh, you know, I haven't been there, but of course, you have. And all of you know that, so I'm very glad for you. And uh, Jack Legend lives on. There's no question about that, but well, everybody who knew Jack will never forget him. Is there anyone else who would like to say something? Laurel. Wonderful testimony to hear all these wonderful things. I just, uh, since I'm the next oldest, following Jack, and I'm only a year younger. <laughs> I didn't have any trouble in school because the teacher saw me coming, and since I looked just like Jack, only in a feminine way, 
they said, aha, there comes another smart one. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, it really worked. I got through school, and I was just as young as Jack. In fact, we were both in West, Har West Hartford High the same year, only I was graduating, and he was doing postgraduate work. And I was just barely 16. So you see, um, it was wonderful to have an older brother. Roger. Tom. Yeah. Laurel's husband, Tom, from Dayton, Ohio. Well, this is a time of sharing, and uh, I had to wait till my wife said a few words. It wouldn't be fair, you know, for me to step up and say something. I'd like to share two things. First of all, um, to share with you the uh, fellowship and the love that, uh, that I've enjoyed by virtue of marrying into this family. You know, I have reliable sources that have told me that when Mother Lundeberg heard that her daughter was dating me, she said, ah, a German? <laughs> so it is a bit of a testimony, Mother, that um, Unfortunately, I'm also the German who took uh, one of the members of the Wonderbird family out of Connecticut. Hey, Brenda. Would you like to say something on Canada Wall? Anything additional? This is an auspicious occasion. Very auspicious occasion. Very. We love popcorn. And I did his hat. I would repair his hat. He'd come to me and say, Dottie, the hat is getting thin on top, so will you put something on it? And I put that little bow on top, and I put pieces of material from every show are on his face. hat. Because I did the costume. No kidding. Yeah. You know, when I just saw that hat uh, Thursday, Wednesday, and Thursday when I was out there. It's, it's it's quite right. a hat. It's quite a hat. Yeah. And I just really love the picture of him in the background on the, uh, not the menu, but the, uh, remember the last play they had, and the Jack was in the background and one of the tables. Oh, yes, yes, yes. He would have had on there. Ilanthe. It was Ilanthe, and he was on there with his hat, and that was great. Yes. We had a great report. Admired each other's work very much. <laughs> <laughs> Which I appreciate it very much. You're very nice. You look like him, too. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Maybe a little bit handsomer? <laughs> A little, no, Not the hair is clever. the same. <laughs> I, I used to follow Jack's hairline, and he was always, you know, I knew how my, how my hairline would look in three and a half years. Oh. <laughs> but don't let it grow long. I didn't like it when it was long. Did you like it when it was long? I didn't like that. No, no. That looked, that's great. You've done a great job. Thank you.